The Gospel reading from the lectionary passages today is John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33. Listen to the Gospel writer as he brings God's word into God's spirit as it makes it a living word in our midst. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest have handed you over to me. What, what have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, break open your word as we ponder it that your truth might reign in our hearts and through us in the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Christ the King Sunday. What, what in the world is that? It's another one of those church holy days that, that nobody really knows all that much about. But why in God's name does the lectionary, the people who put the lectionary readings together, it's a three-year cycle of readings, why do they have us reading this passage about Jesus before Pilate, the Sunday before Advent? And I'm guessing the title of the sermon, King of the Jungle, doesn't give you much clue as to where I'm going either. I mean, as far as you know, it could be a description of the race you had in the parking lot against some huge jacked up pickup truck looking at that last parking space left in the mall on Black Friday morning in the early dawn. Or if you were like me, it could be how you felt yesterday after spending four hours untangling those doggone Christmas lights that somehow between last January 1st and this November 24th have grown biological and to become kudzu vines. Just anybody know what kudzu? Okay, all right. Just. Maybe you're thinking, yeah, jungle. The next four weeks will be a, a jungle. It's you know the, the last minute shopping and the even laster minute wrapping and licking hundreds of envelopes with Christmas cards and baking however many more dozen cookies for some school party or for some office festivity and determining somewhere in the midst of that if you can find three free hours when the weather is decent to go wander around in a vacant parking lot between a bunch of green cut trees and to pick one out only to find out you need to cut 27 inches off the trunk because it's crooked and it takes 45 minutes to shim it in the stand to make sure that with the 100 pounds of ornaments on it, it doesn't fall over during the 6 o'clock news on December 23rd. <laughs> all, all of those things may fit the, the title of this sermon, but I, but I did, as you might imagine, have a bigger jungle in mind, and it's the jungle of which all of those things are just a, a minor part. In this particular segment, of time we call the holidays is simply a brief period in, in the jungle you and I know as life. There's no question in my mind that each one of us knows to some degree what that means, whether it's those simple vignettes I just described or the, the daily barrage of the news another shooting, 
another disaster, another political fistfight, another episode of bigotry or of racism, or just somebody else saying, I've got mine. It's a jungle out there. So, so what on earth does it mean in the middle of that to, to claim Christ is king? And I thought about, thought about kingship this week because of that, you know, King of the Hill used to love to play that as a kid. It just mean you're, you know, you push everybody else off. Sort of like the kids were talking about, the role of the king. Sky King, anybody remember Sky King? Yeah, it's a little twin engine beechcraft, always rescued Penny and everybody else who was in trouble. So you, Elvis, a king, you know, rock and roll at least. King size, it means the biggest and the best. King of the road. Trailer for sale. I, first service, the choir started singing with me. It's, it's, you know, that means that freewheeling, kind of laid back, don't worry, be happy. Ah, uh, it's good to be the king. Mel Brooks, Tom Petty, I don't care who, who said it, but it, you know, having things your way. My favorite as a kid. King me. Checkers, man. <laughs> you tore up the board then. Your opponent is toast. You know, you jump everything any direction you want to go, they're, they're gone. The fact is that, that my guess is most of us probably don't know a lot about kings. I mean, probably, I, you know, my mind, what usually comes to my mind first thing is, is something that, you know, starts with a story. Once upon a time, you know, big castles, the knights sheathed in gleaming armor, banquets and massive tables in some cavernous dining hall. Or maybe what comes to your mind is, is whatever you hear on the news or you, or you read in the supermarket tabloids about some royal family across the pond. When it comes to kings, most of us really don't have a clue. Which is, is sort of, I, I guess, I, I wonder how, how I felt with this gospel passage with, with Jesus and Pilate talking about kings and kingdoms. And, and, and maybe, they're not, maybe they're caught in the same kind of dilemma. I mean, I, I think they both know kings, understand, experience kings, but, but, but they're not talking about the same thing. I mean, it, it remind me of that, that movie, A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, and Tom Cruise, is, Nicholson is in the witness chair, and, and Tom Cruise says, you know, I, I want the truth, and Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth, and you realize they're not on the same page. They're not talking about the same thing. When Jesus is brought before Pilate, the charge against him is he claims to be king of the Jews. Well, Pilate, and Pilate works for the king. One of his jobs is to, to take care of anybody who opposes the king. And that's why Jesus is standing before him, but but the idea that this bruised and beaten man <laughs> standing there could, could be taken for a king probably seemed pretty ridiculous to Pilate. I mean, he, he knows what kings look like. He knows what kings act like. The Pilate does his duty, asks Jesus if the charge against him is true. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, my king, it's this crazy, confusing where did this answer come from? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Do you get a hint of what he's saying? My guess is that Jesus is saying that, that were he and his followers of this world, then naturally they would be using the primary tool this world provides for 
in establishing and keeping power. Violence. Attack ads. Attack dogs. Attack lackeys. But Jesus is not of this world. So he will not defend himself with violence. Jesus will not establish his claims with violence. Jesus Jesus will not usher in God's kingdom by violence. Jesus will not make followers through violence. This is a king whose rules are different. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not enslave, pillage, plunder, rape, and conquer. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The kids, I love, the first answer was taxes. The, The worldly king has you pay taxes to do a whole lot of things, including take care of the royal household. What does the king, what does this king ask you to do with your taxes, to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to take care of the widow and the orphan? In a world where kingly hats are adorned with precious jewels and they don't fall flat on your your head, emblazoned with diamonds and rubies and sapphires embedded in, in forged Precious gold, the only crown this king of kings wore was one of thorns. Monarchs rule from mighty thrones carved of precious stone or rare and exotic wood set high above a multitude of servants so everyone can bow down easily to them. The only throne of this king is a common tree in two pieces raised up for all to see the better to mock and deride him. Earthly kings tend to separate themselves from the masses, living in in lavish settings, guarded by dozens and dozens, occasionally viewed out the window where they wave a supposedly beneficent hand. This king has no place to lay his head. And who does he live with? The lowly the despised, the rejected. Many worldly kings inherit their position by being born of royal blood, but this king sets aside his royal standing, empties himself of everything that befits one of his station, and it is not his bloodline, but his very blood that renders him king of kings. How many kings in history have ruled with an iron fist requiring others, servitude, forced labor? This king lives with an outstretched hand and proclaims to the world, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't barge in, he awaits your invitation, my invitation, to enter our hearts and our homes. My kingdom, my kingdom, Jesus says, is not from here. He he makes it so clear to Pilate that that may be your world, Pilate, but it's it's not man, mine. That may be your understanding of of king, but but that is not the king. That is not the kind of king that stands before you this day. So, So have at it, Pilate. Do, do what your kings do. Work your violence against me. But watch. Look out for what you'll get in return. Forgiveness and mercy and love. 
Go for it, Pilate, and you'll set loose a power that can transform the most hardened of hearts. Not by killing them, but by changing them. I think the lectionary folks who put the texts together inserted this Jesus Pilate text this Sunday before Advent, the Sunday before we start this church year all over again, the the coming of the Christ child. They put this text here to remind us Jesus' cruciform kingdom is grounded in a very different kind of power. For in this kingdom, Jesus tramples death by his death. And it's not in the power of swords and cannons, but it's in the, in the power of his name that the church preaches and teaches and heals and casts out demons. It's a power that's of a different order, but it's a power that rescues you and me from the bondage of sin, from the fear, from the mortal fear of death, and from being enslaved to our little selves. It's a good text to hear. Because the truth is, I don't think most of us, on sometimes even some of our best days, are totally convinced that we believe or want that kind of power. On a lot of days, we're we're with the crowd from that time before Pilate long ago, crowing, crowing for Barabbas and his, and his, his base but reliable power. The knives wetted sharp and, and all holstered up because it's a jungle out there. It really is. But you and I also know our history. We know whenever the church, as it has wandered across the ages of the world, whenever the church has always stumbled and fallen when it's leaned on Barabbas kind of power. And it is won when it's played the long game of faithful dependence on the power of a lamb who is slain. A king who came to serve. Parades of nuclear-tipped military power snaking through the concrete capitals may impress many, but the cross, the cross and, and the power of its mysterious upside-down sacrificial love always wins in the end. Always. For he is king. He always has been. He always will be. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.